no, Jed Fish is not going to UCLA. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn jobs help find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions apply. So Lars, we were we were sitting here, we're having our discussion. We we're like, all right, we're, we're gonna have to get into this at some point. Like I said in our, in our little opener, no, Jed Fish is not going to UCLA. And even if a conversation was had, that doesn't mean the Husky fans should be in any sort of panic. Because let's be real, that conversation in all likelihood was UCLA picking up the phone and saying, Hey Jed, you want the job? Jed saying, no, not, not interested. We're going to get into some of the nuances of this, but let's go over the situation because some people are saying, oh, well he was in Cabo. So, and that's where interviews are being held. Jed Fish was in Cabo before this job opened up. Jed Fish was in, in Cabo because it was his wife's birthday. That's, that's, that's what we've heard. He was down there celebrating his his wife's birthday with her for a couple of days before coming back to Seattle. He put out a tweet saying, oh, I'm on my way back to Seattle. And even if the, the, the conversation was had, there was nothing to imply that it was even a true job interview. Yeah. So, like, you remember the conversation we had back, you know, before the national championship game where Kalen interviewed for the Alabama job, I believe, on that Wednesday or Thursday. We we'll, we'll forgot which day it was, but but Kalen had legitimately interviewed with Alabama officials for the Alabama coaching job before the national championship game, right? That was what we have established, right? We, we know that to be true because it was an actual sit down for more than an hour interview. The right. difference between an interview, doing due diligence, making an inquiry, right? There are all these different, when you when you go to journalism school, right? When you take journalism classes, and I'm not talking journalism 101, I'm talking journalism 300 and 400 level classes. There's a different, you want to talk about credibility. Okay, that's fine. You can say you had a credible source that tipped you off, that sure. said UCLA would, would have considered Jed Fish. However, there was now monetary reasons why they couldn't because they wouldn't pay the buyout. So if you are going into a conversation, if your source even tells you you're going into a conversation and the school can't pay the buyout, you can't then say there's an interview. You can say there was a discussion. Yep. You can say there was mutual interest, which there wasn't, but you can say that if you want. You, you can say X, Y, and Z, but you can't say there was an actual full-on interview. Now, right. again, people want to stretch things to make what make it uh, what it was, right? And you could probably point to some reports of other outward out uh, network people saying oh well ucla is interviewing brent brennan right which also turned out not to be the case right but one doesn't create another right just because one said hey we're taking your coach now we're going to say hey the other guy because somebody tipped me off now here's the thing would ucla be interested in jed fish probably actually yeah because he's coming Absolutely. off a 10 win season show that he could rebuild use uh, arizona the job that he would be or any coach would be inheriting at UCLA would be a rebuild or would be a certainly retooling, especially given the lack of a job that Chip Kelly did in terms of recruiting and continuing to build the roster into 24 and 25. So with that being said, of course, Jed would be a natural name that Martin Jarman would want to call and say, Hey Jed, is there any potential? And then, you know what? Now nah, we know you're not because we can't pay your buyout anyways. The fact that UCLA wouldn't pay the buyout, negates the interview you can say there was a discussion you can say martin and jed met you can say x y and z but you can't call it a true interview because that's not what it was there was discussions right. had there was interest on one party or another but to classify it and call your report an interview is disingenuous and there's no other way around that so let's take it a step beyond that because you can say all you want about all of this. And, you know, there were, there are, there are tweets that are floating around out there where, Oh, maybe this is a different discussion. If this job opened up in December, maybe we, we don't know that we can't say that for sure because 
seemed like just with all the the budget restrictions and everything else going down on down in Arizona, yeah, wouldn't be any kind of surprise if Jed was somewhere else. Let's say Kalen DeBoer doesn't leave Washington, and maybe maybe that that place is UCLA, right? But we don't need to go down that road. And just to to, to c- continue. What does UCLA have that Washington doesn't? Uh, weather? Like, I'm, hey, I'm from Southern California. Yeah, the weather's pretty nice down there. I know it's pouring or been pouring for the last couple of days. But when you look at UCLA, you're playing second fiddle to USC, and it's not necessarily close. They got a fantastic medical school. Shout out to UCLA for that. But when you look at the the nil factor and you look at a whole lot of the other things that ucla brings to the table it's it doesn't hold a candle to the program across town let alone some of the other programs in the big 10 where getting chip kelly out of there that had to happen sooner or later that's probably a great move on the part of ucla where he was doing fine he, he did a couple of nice things but it's not like he was ever going to truly transcend that program he just looked like he didn't care anymore so getting him out of there, what all everything that goes along with that, not a surprise. But especially when we look at what what Jed Fish has said with Washington in the last week, he seems to understand what it takes to build a winning program. And you can take one look at UCLA, and this is no disrespect because I, I like some of the players that they have, you know, and, and they, they do have a lot of nice things going for them. But you can argue that Washington, w- even with some struggles in 2019 and 2021 has been one of the best 10 to 15 programs in the country for the last eight years. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and if you actually want to even take it a step, not further, but maybe kind of find a side alley to go down. There is, there is a reason Jed Fish would have interest in UCLA. It's not for sure. the job. It's for a person that was on that staff, and that's Kaika Malloy, right? The, you, right? I can see, I can see Jed saying, "Hey, what's the situation with the Kaika? I know Chip left. Do I have to pay a buyout? Can we negotiate half a buyout?" I'm looking at interviewing some because Jed even said at his um, signing day press conference on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, where we're still interviewing five to six coaches for that one linebacker position. So yeah. it's not like he's got like two or three names; he's got four or five or six, and he would be remiss if he didn't at least say, "Hey, could I get a shot of the Kaika?" Oh no, I can't. Okay, cool. Oh, would I be interested in the job? No, I'm good. Thanks. That's not an interview. That, 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 right. that, 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 that could be exactly what the conversation was. And that's <laughs> not an interview. Like this is more of an interview than what that conversation was, right? This is still a back and forth conversation, but like you're the amount of times like, Hey, you know, what do what you, Roman, what are your thoughts on this? What do you, what, what, you ask me, what are my thoughts on this? That is more of an interview than anything that was discussed between UCLA and Jenkins. No, absolutely. And that, and because, Again, what what is UCLA going to offer that that Washington hasn't already? Where look at, look at the hires that Jed Fish went out and made in in the past couple of weeks, going out and getting Steve Belichick, getting Vinny Sanceri, getting a really really truly just impressive offensive coaching staff that he brought with him from Arizona. I don't I don't know if UCLA can afford that right now. They can't they can't fill up half their stadium, and yeah, it's a massive stadium. But they, they can barely do that. What what are they going to say? Oh, yeah, here, we're going to give you, like, because we still don't have an exact figure on what Fish's assistant coach salary pool. Let's, are, are, are they going to give him nine and a half million for that pool? Absolutely not. They, what? They're, yeah, they're and, not going to do that. Right. And the other thing is, Arizona couldn't do it either. So, like, that's the thing. So, Jed yeah. was going to move somewhere. And here's the thing where it does ring true, right? Jed is not going to stay at Washington for nine years. As much as I love the Stu Guts nature of his you know, open mic at, at the yeah. men's basketball game last Saturday. He's not staying in Washington for nine years, right? There's just no way that's happening. No way. There's not – in this day and age of college football, no coach is really going to stay for sure. seven-plus years, right? If, and if you do – it does, great, but – Right, but if and more so – if you are having them stay, it means there's going to be a lot of assistant coach turnover because those coordinators are not going to become head coaches or go to the NFL like Ryan Grubb, right? And so there's so sure. many options for these guys – but again, the problem is if they're making those moves, it means people want them because they won and they're good. Alabama wanted Kalen Moore because he won and he's good. And they got Ryan Grubb and, and Ryan Seahawks want Ryan Grubb. Because he's shown, hey, I can pretty much build any type of offense you want. So if Jed wins at Washington, he's probably gone in two or three years, which is fine. Not to UCLA, but like, again, it, yeah, it's, it would so be yeah, the NFL. 
So again, are we blind in saying that, oh, and Jed Fish is not leaving Washington. He's never leaving Washington. No, but we're not saying that. We're just saying this is not – it's real enough he's to talk about, UCLA. but he's not going to UCLA, and that was never a real thought to begin with. So, Lars, in honor of the Super Bowl, which, you know, as as our everyday is listening to this on Monday, we're going to just relive some of the super moments from 2023. Right after a message from our friends over at LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the job. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to find, help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is so easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 20 24 hours. And LinkedIn is also constantly finding ways to help make the hiring process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. And you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So Lars, let's, we're going to, we're going to have a little fun. We're going to do a top five countdown of Washington's best moments from 2023. And this is really hard to nail down because there are so many different ones that you can choose from. And I I, I had a lot of trouble putting this list together. So I'm going to defer to you here. What do you have at number five? Number five to me, I would probably go Devin Culp's touchdown against USC. Oh, I like that. Be- because that yeah. one where it's not a game winner, right? It's not, but it certainly was kind of that, what ended up putting because they only won by seven, right? And so right. it ended up kind of being that key. Which Actually, where, no, they won by ten. Or, right. Yeah. Right. Close, close, close enough. <laughs> but my point is, it was that one key separating touchdown, right? Where instead of getting into a field goal game like you do with Oregon twice, right, you're you're now getting into a touchdown game where hey, that was kind of the one play that Penix needed to make. And if you also remember, it's not just the catch; it's Penix showing that he can roll from one side of the field to the other throw it on a dime in between traffic. And I actually believe Josh Quavers or somebody else was in front of Devin Culp. That was actually yeah, maybe could have been the actual target for that pass. But again, it was kind of one of those where it wasn't the highest moment for, for Mike, but it was a signature moment for both Mike and Devin because Devin, you know, again, historically hadn't had a lot of marquee catches, right? So it was Devin's way of shedding his drop history. It was Michael's way of saying, hey, I can actually scramble and make things work. And it really kind of started to put UC, USC away that night that ended up kind of cementing that run in early November. So I'm glad you went with the USC game because I also have USC, but I couldn't pick one moment from that game because you can couple in so many. You have ZTF sack fumble of Caleb Williams, which was emotional for so many reasons with his dad passing. And you can kind of couple that together with his his running out onto the field at, during this, the uh, senior day at the Apple Cup with all of that, which is very emotional and, and just really touching when we got to talk to him a little bit about that story and just how much his dad loved UW and loved the program, which is all really great. You have the Devin Culp catch as you covered. And then the, the biggest story of that game, really Dylan Johnson, 256 yards and four touchdowns where if he, you, he had the same exact number of yards as Michael Penix did in that game, which, you know, it's, I, and it also created my, my personal favorite meme from the season of, of Alex Grinch just there with his hands on his knees, just devastated after the fourth touchdown of the game, which was just fantastic for so many other reasons for me personally. But I think that all of that coupled together is really amazing. And it was a dominant offensive showing where we saw so many different things happen at different times with this team on their run to the national championship. And this one is a really cool, just, it was one of those moments where, all right, I know that, uh, it was, I believe it was you who said this is where their one loss in the regular season is going to come. And that was just another barrier that they found a way to hurdle over on their run to the national championship. So what do you got at number four? I would say it is kind of hilarious. We both had US, Washington beating Oregon, but losing somehow to yeah. somebody else not in Oregon, right? <laughs> um, because it was probably because it was at home. That, that, that was that, That's what I had with, for that. That's fair. So number four for me, I'm going to go later in November. I'm going to go, and this isn't, again, necessarily a great play, but in the grand sure. scheme of things, I'm like, it's going to be a 1A, 1B. So it's a 4A, 4B. The fourth down 
um, end around to uh, Roma Dunze oh, against Rashi to say that set up the Grady Gross. So the, the, the number four for me was going to be Grady Gross' 24-yard game order against Washington State to send them to the Pac-12 championship. Because again, 40, 42, yeah. 42, right. 41 yards, no. but um, <laughs> You said 24. Whatever. But my, my, and, you know, and for Grady, all those kicks, it could be 24 or 44. He was still making them. It doesn't matter. Because I will say – but and I will say the one time that he did have his kick blocked prior to that was against Utah on the final drive. Yep. So it was That's kind true. of a good way for him to kind of get that confidence back. And he never missed from the rest of the season after that. So and also got put on scholarship. So it's kind of just kind of a crescendoing moment, right? And the reason why I'm putting right. it at four was because of three, two, and one, right? So this is I kind of can only sneak Grady in here. It's like well, and again, seals the first undefeated season and regular season for the back twelve. Sends Washington back to the Pac-12 championship, gets the rematch against Oregon. You know, sets set everything up that is to come in motion. Right. So, I I like all your points there. At number four, I have someone who Washington fans probably aren't happy to hear his name, but Jabbar Muhammad's performance against Oregon State, because that that in itself was just a mess of a game. And you look at the drops, you look at just some of the struggles that you saw early on from the defense. And when Oregon State was forced to throw, I, I just I've never seen a cornerback play be that dominant just in that way over the course of an entire game. Where you know every once in a while you see a catch and it's oh okay yeah you know he he gave up one the, these things happen uh, that that didn't happen. Jabbar had two picks, four pass breakups, and according to Pro Football Focus, a zero point zero passer rating when targeted. So he had just an absolutely fantastic game. Also, he forces a fumble that's recovered by Carson Bruner. So he was responsible for all three turnovers that the Beavers had that day. And without one of those turnovers, the Huskies might not win that game. And you'll, you'll see which moment I actually end up leaving off here from, from the top five, because I just felt that that performance was the final like true road test for this team. Because, you know, yeah, the Apple Cup, was very close and we didn't, we kind of didn't expect the game to go that way, but without this performance and, you know, maybe Oregon state drives down and kicks a field goal and they win 23, 22, the apple cup is looked at a little differently because now all of a sudden you're concerned that the Huskies might not make it into the playoff, even if they do end up beating uh, Oregon in, in the Pac-12 championship game. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, that whole kind of month of November, right? That's why I started at number five with the USC game. Yeah. Where it's like that. It's a, it's incredible to look back and say, "Wow, Washington got through October and then had to start all over again and get all the way through right. November." Because it was like it started. October started with Arizona. Yeah, and that nail biter, and then you go right. beat Oregon, and then you just have the absolute calamity that was Arizona Oof. State. And then what was it? Stanford after that, and I, I, I'm honestly yeah. Stanford right. was next. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Right, and, and, and and so it's kind of almost like, hey, look, you know what? I don't care what the score is, as long as there's a W next to our name. Like it could be right. seven to six, it could be three to two. I don't care what it is. It could be six to three. The Alabama LSU game from ages ago, where it's no offense, all defense. I don't really care, as long as you win the game and just get that's, just get. That's all that just, mattered. Because and, and as we saw this season, we were both predicted one loss and still getting into the, to the CFP. That was not in play if they lost, right. unless it was yep. to Oregon and they didn't lose to Oregon. So, you know, they didn't really have much of a margin for error. So, number three for me, I'm going to continue to kind of take this forward momentum. Either I'm going to pull it back for number two and then spring forward for number one. Dylan Johnson's final run against Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. Oh, because again, I, I'm more or less going for okay. What are symbolic moments that are also still key, right? Because as we saw in the Sugar Bowl or in the national, yeah, the, yeah, the Sugar Bowl where Dylan yeah. was basically in that same position, and it went the exact opposite way, where right. you go from third and five to instead of getting a first down and sealing the Pac-12 championship to now, ooh, I don't know if our guy's good to go for the national championship because we wanted right. to take one one more play off the clock. So I think the fact that Dylan was able to kind of, and it also was great for Dylan because that kind of was a true signature moment for him getting a transfer from the sec and getting over a thousand yards, 10 plus touchdowns. You know, it really kind of was the like flag planning game for him to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, we're not punting. We're not playing the clock here. I'm going to get this first down and we're going to send Oregon to the, 
you know, back to the coast. And I think that was kind of a true statement. And that's why that whole week after that felt like, hey, Washington really beat the brakes off Oregon. It wasn't as close as the final score indicated. No, you're 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 absolutely right, especially because so spoiler alert, I'm we're gonna jump around here a little bit, but I actually don't have the Pac-12 championship game at all in my top five. Where you're right, because that that game for the longest time, even when Oregon took the lead, it is when you look at the way the majority of that first half played out, it just felt like Washington was in control of that game for such a long time. You go up by 10 on the Quinton Moore score, and yeah, you know, of course, then the Treshawn Holden comes right back and scores a touchdown. But it just it felt like for a good majority of that game that Washington was in control. And so we'll, we're going to get to my number three right after a quick break. Right after we send a message to our good friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. And, you know, as I, I know this isn't going to come as a shock to anybody with some of, some of my previous attire that I, I I see when people put down in the comments. Uh, I'd bet on the Celtics to to win the NBA Finals. Let's let's just go ahead and I know I'm a jinx, so probably not going to happen now because I said it. But I I would still ride Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Derek White, my guys. Let's see it happen. All you got to do for all these bets is just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel is an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. So Lars, my number three is somewhere you went a little while ago where I've got the Apple Cup. At number, just again, the, the whole thing, because that was for the longest time we're sitting there in the booth where, oh, oh, this is this is not how we expected this game would go. And you sit there, you got to sweat it out a little bit when you're thinking about just, okay, all the implications that are on the line, 12-0, and 0, the final conference Apple Cup. There's, there's so, there's so much going on there. Yeah. Your, your heart just starts racing and racing as the game gets closer and closer to the end. And we're down there on the field for, for that, that final end around call. And I'm standing there with, with some of the staffers on the sideline and you can just see them go berserk after that fourth down call. And it almost just felt like after that, that play, there was that huge sigh of relief where everything just felt so tense and just, for, for the longest point of that game. You, and then you see Roma Dunze running right at you down the sideline here. Oh, okay. They're, they're, they're going to find a way to do this. So between that Grady making the kick and then getting put on scholarship, all of those moments combined together were, were just really one of the very many occasions that made this such a special season. See, I, I realized I kind of might have botched this one here because again, now that because I'm going some, because I'm starting to think of which one I'm going to leave off. And, and and now we got we got three plays for two spots. Oh, so see, I, I I already cheated. I know how I'm going to do this. So so someone's getting left out. So I'm actually going to call it audible within my own head here because okay. I'm not. And I'll, and I'll explain at the end which one I end, ended up kind of audibly out of. Number two, Mish Powell winning the game all by himself. Like because at, at that point that that's that one was of the those. one I had to leave off, and, and so that was. And, and I'm glad that I decided to call the pivot there because there, that that's one where I'm like, okay, Grady does seal everything. Great, yeah, you know, X one Z, and all this happens. None of that happens. None of it happens without Mish Powell's right. pick six and yeah, the fact that right. we were in the elevator and we had <laughs> no clue what was going on and we're like zero. And, 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 and we're, you know, we're, we're both in our in our heads getting, okay, how are we going to write this obituary? How are we going to, man, after everything, after this team was so close, like awesome. how do they lose to Arizona? I mean, Kelly, Kenny, Kenny Dillingham, great coach. Kenny Dillingham, great coach. Sure. Brian Ward, great defensive coordinator. So not taking any shade away from them even now, but especially back Absolutely. then, right? But even in that worst case scenario, Washington should still win that game. Like there was no way with the amount of bodies that Arizona State didn't have. But yeah, then to go on the field and we walk out back on the concourse and we just hear the fans start screaming. We're like, well, something happened. Let's let's, let's paint a like a, a clearer picture because we were standing there by the elevator waiting after the timeout was called. We were said, okay, we think we have enough time to get down there right now. The elevator from the press box down to the field took a little bit to get there. And right as the elevator doors close, we see them just kind of running back out on the field. It looks like the ball is going to be snapped. We're, oh man, 
Ah, uh, well, let, let's see what happens here. I'm in my head thinking, okay, I, I think they have a chance to get the stop here, but let's see if the offense could do anything was my thing. We can't hear anything in the elevator. It is silent. We, we could not hear, oh, just, we, you could hear pin drop in there. We get down to the bottom. We hear the crowd cheering. It's like, oh, oh, maybe they got the stop. And you and I look up to the monitor that's in the, in the corner of the concourse there. And all we see is Mish Powell crossing the goal line. And we just looked at each other. We were like, no way. Yeah. Yeah. No way. So that was all really, really cool. Now, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, it was just kind of a cool full circle moment, especially talking about Grady Goes. From Mish was a former walk on from O'Day, yeah. now has this big signature moment. And so, for all, I just wanted to say that real quick, because for all the people that are like blasting some of these kids for leaving, especially the instate kids, Garen, Mish, Nate, Yep. That, but for any, anybody else that's in the state that at least was a part of this national championship run gets to leave because you did your yeah. job. Now, if you weren't a part of it, eh, different story. So let's move on to, to, to my number two now, where this might shock some people. I have the Sugar Bowl at number two. So, yeah, I, 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 I get it. If, some, if you have that number one, leave us, leave us some comments down below where, of course, like I mean, you understand. So, my 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 favorite moment from the Sugar Bowl is obviously watching Michael Penix. I'm texting with one of my NFL guys the entire time. We're just raving over how good he looks. And then get down to the field and hopefully future friend of the pod, Kenny Main, comes up standing next to me. And he just he he looks at me and he goes, as as this is after the punt when the the, the long runs have the ball back, they're driving down the field. He looks at me and he goes, they lose this game. This is on me. I when I was on the ESPN broadcast over there a little while ago, I I called game right after that that shot to Roma Dunze down the sideline, and I was like, you know, I like I don't know if I can out you, but now that everything has happened the way that it did, I want to make sure he put that out there. Watching watching all of that happen, the experience of New Orleans as a whole going to the college football playoff, and you know, as somebody who, as I said earlier, from Los Angeles, was really hoping for the Rose Bowl got to see everything happen the way that it did. That was just such a special moment for so many reasons for, for I know for both of us and like for me personally, where growing up being, being around this team, watching it every year, it's, it was just really, really cool to see all that happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, being the first team to win the sugar bowl from the pac 12 first and only, you know, it's because again, never, never before, never again, you know? And so there's that now that was kind of where I was going to go where, okay, that now you have, what because i'm because i have one right because i I yeah you're you're yeah so i have one right so 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 yeah so i had misha too so this becomes again which one do you take do you take the sugar bowl or do you take the one that set everything up and i was gonna take the sugar bowl but you can still take the sugar bowl but since you did i'm gonna put the one for uno at the top and just put roma dude i'm 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 just gonna put roma dude there i like it it. i like it because I mean, there's so and, and the well, the one play if I could pick one, it's the alley oop where um, you know we're both on the field in the corner of the end zone thinking, okay, perfect, like all right, all right, and it's like 142, 141, and you go back and watch the game against Oregon in October, and Kirk Hershey says, okay, the game clock starts now, and it's got you know one, one over ninety seconds left, and Pettis is like, yeah, actually they're not taking, they're not waiting, they're going, we're, and and you know and. And I think that was kind of indicative of what Washington was this season where, okay, if we're going to do this, we might as well do it now because there's no sense in dragging this thing out and playing it out. And I think it, it almost kind of culminates everything because when you watch this team during practice, it was, we would pick up on, oh, hey, well, if there's 30 seconds left on the clock. Oh, they're doing like a 30 second drill. They're doing a one minute drill, a two minute. These coaches put them in position so often to where, now again, you can't replicate the crowd and everything in practice, but they knew what the down and distance was and what they truly needed to get more often than not. I think that's why if I'm a Seahawks fan, I'm pumped. Drafting Michael Penix. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> pumped. But so, no, I mean, whether you draft Penix or not, you got the best cook in the in the kitchen right now. That's true. No, that's that's absolutely true. So I I love that you just said Roma Dunze and you can encapsulate his season in that moment because you're right. But I so I also I just went with that whole college game day, Oregon game at number one, because again, let's paint a little bit of a picture here. We were both in red square by let's call it four 30 in the morning, right? We 
get to have this really cool experience with covering college game day, seeing everything that goes on with that, um, getting to talk a little bit to Troy Dannon that day and all the other things that we got to do behind the scenes where it's watching Joel McHale make these picks, just experiencing the atmosphere that when you look at one of the reasons that we love to cover this team, it's because of moments like that, because of getting those kinds of experiences, because again, I know I said it on a show the other day, but that kind of, that kind of interest and passion is available to this athletic department whenever it wants it. And that day encapsulates the whole moment. As we walk down there for the game, we see all the extra seats in the press box because, you know, the entire NFL wants to come out and watch this game. We see Michael Penix freestyling on the sidelines but for, for all of that about making the comeback. And then on top of that, not only did we get to stand right there and watch Roma Dunze win the game, but we were also wa- like walking down there with Jalen Polk as he brings in that ball on the sidelines. We're standing right behind the bench trying to get over to that side of the field anyways. And then, oh, hey, this just happened right in front of us. That whole moment, that whole environment, storming the field, all of that was like truly incredible. Well, I was going to say, and then there's the the kick, right? Where it's, yeah. it's it's the video that I had. I know Coker and a few others commented where it's like you can just hear the video where it's like you're looking at it. From, so we have no clue what's going in, right? We have at least from my vantage yeah, point. We, we can't I'm only, tell. Everything I'm basing is the reaction from the student section that I'm looking at right now. And so right. it's you, know, you can hear the crowd, like, the loud, loud. Cam Lewis kicks it, and everything goes silent. It's it truly like it truly goes silent, and it's one of those like. <laughs> and, and then the right. eruption and, and the decimal levels and everything that came with it. And it was kind of one of those, you know, can Washington defeat the demon, right? You know, you did it in Eugene last year. Can you really down the dragon again? Can you can you yeah. avenge what Sark did in 13? Or can you avenge, you know, the other history of game day coming to Washington where it's like 20, you know, Washington, yeah. Right, where like Washington, hey, you have the chance, you have the chance, and you blew it, and you blew it, and you blew it, and hey, you didn't blow it. Here we go. Like, and right. so I think it was, it was kind of like that turner, that 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 truly corner turning point in the season where okay, they, they can really do it this year. That they got over the biggest, yeah. you got over the biggest hurdle. You still got some, you still got to climb back down the mountain, and you can still die coming back down the mountain, but you passed your biggest test, right? And that's because that was up to that point, especially when you look at the regular season encapsulated. That was far and away the biggest test, oh, yeah. and of course everything played out perfectly with meeting them again in the Pac-12 championship game, beating them again as Oregon fans will still say, Oh, well the Oregon was better. No, no, they weren't like, let's, let's just call spade a spade, but it really was a special season. And we wanted to do something a little, a little cheesy and just say, Oh, it's super because you know, Super Bowl Sunday being able to record this. You, you have a point, please. I do want to say with that being said, got to talk back to the Super Bowl. The cool thing is, but which game was it? I believe it was the Oregon game or whichever one. It was, maybe it might have been the Apple Cup. Whichever one Trent McDuffie came back for. And Utah. He said, so Utah. Utah. The Utah game. That he's like, hey, just watch your Cam Fab. The fact that Cam Fab is coming back now means we get that Trent McDuffie tie in one more time. Right. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. We really hope you enjoyed this. We're going to have, as especially like over the course of the off season, we've got a whole lot of big plans for you. Get, doing some some fun stuff like this is absolutely part of it. So please feel free to leave a comment down below if you have anything in particular you want to see. And the best way to just make sure you keep up to date with everything that we're doing is make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, we're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day. So please make sure you leave a like on the video, leave us a comment down below. If you're audio only, please leave us a five-star review. It all really does help the show out a lot. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on Tuesday.